All right, all right. Good morning, everybody. So great to see you. Thanks for coming out. Welcome to all of our locations, everybody online. So great to have you. If, if you're a guest, I'm Jared, and I get to be the senior pastor of these wonderful people known as Grace Community Church. It's so great to have you. And what you just saw is our annual Night to Shine prom for families with those with special needs. And a huge shout out to our Warwick campus and Pastor Mike, our Warwick lead pastor there, and his leadership. And I know he'd want me to be sure and, 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 and name uh, his staff and, and volunteers there at Warwick and volunteers all around our campuses. I just don't want to miss anybody's name. So thank you all. Love you. Appreciate you. What a, what a joy to be able to get to do an event like that. And we're able to do so because you give and you tithe. And we get to pull that off. We get to provide limousines and red carpet and DJs and catering, and so thank you for enabling us to love our community in such a way. Okay, we're in Revelation today, and uh, it's going to get rough. So much so, I've been listening to Christmas music all week, getting ready for our time for you. I'm not even joking, y'all. I've been hanging in there with the first Noel all week. So let me pray and we'll dig in. Lord, we love you. We need you. I pray, Holy Spirit, you would open our hearts for what is light and good and also what will be tough to take in. We, we know you're the God over it all. It is your word. And so as we seek to be faithful to your word, Holy Spirit, open our hearts to your word and your word to our hearts, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. I was thinking this week when Christy was pregnant with our boys, she knew the pain was coming, but she wasn't obsessed about it. You know, I mean, she, she decorated the room, got the crib, bought baby clothes, and of course she had to go through the pain to come, but she wasn't distracted by it. She was looking forward to the beauty that would come. That's how you need to read Revelation. You read Revelation in the sense there's a lot of bothersome, disturbing, and it really is. It should bother you a lot. It should. But it's to remember that God is at work and he's good and he's moving something like birth pains where we go through or we see there's a lot of pain, but there's something beautiful coming. And that's ultimately for his people. And so that's why I'm calling you, if you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, repent and believe in the good news so that you can be a part of the beauty and the glory that is to come. So where have we been in Revelation? We have seen uh, John writing and Jesus speaking to the churches, and then we get into the moment where only Jesus is worthy to open this scroll that brings humanity to its end. And when Jesus takes the scroll, Roman, I'm sorry, Revelation chapter 5, all of heaven loses its mind in worship of Jesus for this scroll that he's, gonna, he's going to take. And so last week we talked about that when Jesus took this scroll, it might have looked a little something like this in heaven, right? It has seven seals. And when Jesus took the scroll, last week we saw him breaking one seal at a time. And with each seal came a judgment of God upon the, the evil and the immorality and the depravity of those unbelieving on the earth. So he broke one seal, and then he broke the second seal, and we saw this happen. And now this week he gets to the sixth seal, or last week the sixth seal. And now when he breaks the seventh seal, that releases trumpet judgment. So we're going to go from a scroll, scroll to one of these today. And don't even think I can play this. I don't even, I don't even know how to hold it right. So, but it looks a little something like that. I imagine they're much more bigger with these mighty angels, but it's trumpets. And each trumpet blast is a judgment that falls on the earth that we're going to see here over the next little while. Now, as we get into this, this is something that stood out to me this week that I've never thought about. Here's what we're going to see happen today. We're going to see what happens when holiness hits the earth and when hell hits the earth. So the first trumpets, we see holiness hit the earth and what holiness will do to sin and evil and depravity and immorality in a sinful world. And then we're going to see what happens when hell hits the earth right after this in the judgments. So let's just jump right in. Revelation chapter 8, verse 1. When the Lamb opened the seventh seal... There was silence in heaven for about half an hour, y'all. When there's been all that sound of worshiping Jesus, losing their minds in heaven, then all the sound and the sights of the judgments of the first six seals fall upon the earth. 
And then there's worship of Jesus, even with that. And now all that sight and sound, it goes quiet. Something's coming. And here we go. Verse 2. Then I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and seven trumpets were given to them. And another angel came and stood at the altar with a golden censer. And he was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints rose before God from the hand of the angel. Saints is God's people who are now in heaven, namely those who have lost their lives, been martyred, murdered for their faith. What struck me about this is that there are prayers offered. Incense, Old Testament temple, incense represented worship going up to God uh, and prayers of, of, of aromas, sweet aromas to God going up. And here it says there are prayers of the people which is beautiful, but there's incense from heaven added to it. God adds holiness to those prayers, which, which is good news for us. Because if, if you ever pray like me, sometimes I pray a little selfishly some, with some wrong motives, but I've learned that God fixes our prayers on the way up. So he adds his holiness to our prayers. So know this, God loves your prayers. He wants to hear your prayers. Only you can pray like you. Only you have your heart to pray from your heart. God gathers your prayers. He loves your prayers. He keeps your prayers, and he fixes them on the way up. So we see this holiness, though, being added. So, so think about that. God in Scripture is worshiped as holy, 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 not as love, love, love. Now, of course, he is love, but we can get that piece. What we have a hard time grasping is that he is white, hot, holy, holy, holy. And that's what the angels break the sound barrier of heaven declaring in worship of him. So holy that no sin and evil can be in his presence. That's why we must believe upon Christ Jesus to be made right with God so that we can enter into his holy, holy, holy presence, not in fear, but to dance. That only comes through Christ. So now we see just a pinch of his holiness among the prayers cast down upon an evil world. Verse five, then the angel took the censer and filled it with fire from the altar, this holiness of God, and he threw it on the earth and there were peals of thunder and rumblings and flashes of lightning and an earthquake. That's the beginnings of what holiness does upon the earth. And then it happens through these trumpets. Verse six, now the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to blow them. Now when they blow these trumpets, if you go back and read Exodus where God delivered his people out of Egypt, he brought judgment on the Egyptians in light of the prayers of, of God's people to deliver them from bondage. He cast all these judgments on, e on Egypt so that they would be set free to be gone through the Red Sea by God, parting the Red Sea to their freedom, to the promised land. So there's a lot of the judgments here in Revelation that mimic some of the judgments that happen there in Exodus in the Old Testament. But what we find is God is showing an ultimate Exodus for his people here at the end of human history, where judgment doesn't come on a nation, it comes on the world, a world against God and against his people. First trumpet, it affects the land. Verse 7, the first angel blew his trumpet, and there followed hail and fire mixed with blood, and these were thrown upon the earth, and a third of the earth was burned up, and a third of the trees were burned up, and all green grass was burned up. We know how wildfires can take out acres, maybe even miles, but not whole continents. In the same way, I thought of the Amazon rainforest this week. You know the Amazon rainforest is called the, the lungs of the earth What's going to happen when that's incinerated? This is what it's implied here. Could this be nuclear war, a military destruction? Some commentators go in that direction. I don't. This is supernatural, what's happening here. And we'll continue to see it. So second trumpet. First one affected the land. This one affects the sea. Verse 8. The second angel blew his trumpet. And something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea. And a third of the sea became blood. And a third of the living creatures in the sea died. And a third of the ships destroyed. Tsunamis and, and ash and disease and stench. And the, the ships that brought exports and imports wiped out. What in the world is this mountain thrown into the sea? Well, you know, in my mind, it automatically went asteroids and went down a rabbit hole about NASA this week. So you have to bear with me, all right? 
I looked up this. You know that there is NASA's most wanted, the five most dangerous asteroids in our solar system? I came across the 1950DA asteroid. If it hit the Earth, it would release the equivalent of 75 billion tons of TNT. And it would cause a global catastrophe wiping out humanity. Then that, that's something natural, y'all. But God in his sovereignty, in his, in his patience and love, still bringing people to him, throws something supernatural on the earth that wipes out just a portion of it. So let it be a warning to those without Christ. It's as if God is collapsing creation on those who worshiped it. And remember, this is God's holiness that's hitting the earth right now. Third trumpet. First one affected the land, second one the sea, the third one affects rivers and springs. And keep in mind that 71% of the earth is water. Verse 10, the third angel blew his trumpet and a great star fell from heaven blazing like a torch and it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters became Wormwood and many people died from this water because it had been made bitter. So again, NASA, right? I came across meteors that can be out there somewhere. And in February of 2013, a literal meteor hit over a region in Russia. And it was such a powerful meteor that it lit up the sky as some witness, brighter than the sun, blinding and shattered windows all in that region. And when a meteor hits the atmosphere, it bursts into pieces. So it's kind of that idea of something God does, it bursts into pieces and it begins to land at different rivers and streams, making it wormwood. That word wormwood means bitter. It's from this herb that, that literally poisons water. It's like liquid death. And it gives the impression that it's so powerful, your water fil filtration system will not help you. He goes on, fourth trumpet. First one, the land, second one, the sea, the third one, the rivers and springs, and now holiness hits the heavenlies. Verse 12, the fourth angel blew his trumpet, and a third of the sun was struck, and a third of the moon, and a third of the stars, so that a third of their light might be darkened, and a third of the day might be kept from shining, and likewise, a third of the night. So I don't know, maybe this means the climate changes and there's storms and the sea tides are affected and there's environmental disaster and plant life is, is interrupted. What struck me about this as well is that this is the fourth trumpet and it coincides with the fourth day in which God created. On the fourth day, God created stars and the moon and the sun and now it's all collapsing. And it's fitting where it talks here about water and light because this falls upon the world who rejected the living water known as Jesus. It's also falling upon a world who rejected the light of the world. And again, that is Jesus himself. Then in verse 13, I looked and I heard an angel crying with a loud voice as it flew directly overhead, woe, woe, woe to those who dwell on the earth at the blasts of the other trumpets that the three angels are about to blow. He's just getting warmed up, y'all. Dwell on the earth. Always note that phrase. It means those who love their lives on the earth. They only thought about the earth. They only thought about their money on the earth, their security on the earth, their desires on the earth, their feelings on the earth. They rarely gave God a thought. It was all about their world, their earth. They never thought about where they go when they die. It's those who loved their sin, pleasures, and so forth, and so on. And this word, woe, three woes, meaning the worst is to come. And that word woe literally means this. You have nowhere to turn. You have nowhere to turn. You have nowhere to turn. So how do we even respond to this much, y'all? Here's how we should respond. Worship. For he is holy, holy, holy. He is not life coach, life coach, life coach. He is creator, holy God. And remember this, in case we read this and it disturbs us deeply, and it should, I'm not having fun preaching this, y'all. I'm trying to put some sugar on it to make it a little more palatable, but I don't like this. I would never choose to preach this. I chose, I believe God chose us to, to go through the book of Revelation verse by verse, chapter by chapter. I'm not cherry picking. We're just seeing where the Holy Spirit takes us through it. I don't choose to preach these kinds of judgments, but God has it for us to bring into our lives, to do some soul searching, 
to see where we are with God. And maybe you're here and you don't have a relationship with God. This is for you. And also as we hear these disturbing images and realities and judgments that are to come, keep this in mind that from the time there was sin in Genesis, from that moment on, God has been pursuing all humanity, including you up to this moment in love to reach for you so that you might repent and turn to him. He brought deliverance of his people through a Red Sea. He raised up Moses, the prophet. He brought a temple that represented his presence among the people. He put priests in the temple to represent God to the people and represent the people to God. He raised up prophets who preached for hundreds of years, calling people to repent and turn to God. Then you get to the New Testament and Christ is born. Look how God is after you. He came as a baby to be born for you in a sinful world. And then there's teachers and preachers and apostles in the New Testament calling out, repent, repent. And then you got a church like Grace Community Church where the preacher's standing up here going, repent, repent. Look at how God's pursuing you. God even went so far to pursue you that his son went to a cross for you to die for your sin and be raised up on the third day, defeating sin, defeating evil now ascended to the right hand of God and through faith in him, you are born again and made right with God and now you dance in his holiness and you are with him as your father. (laughs) So before we go, gosh, how could God do that? How could he not? He's been pursuing people and now he's giving people what they want, not him, themselves. So this is where we gotta pause and take some stock here. And remember what God has done and how he's pursued us and we worship him. And we see how holy he is, just a pinch of holiness and what it does to an evil world. We should worship him for his holiness and also his love. Now, we move from holiness hitting the earth to hell hitting the earth. Fifth trumpet, verse one of chapter nine. And the fifth angel blew his trumpet. And I saw a star fallen from heaven to earth, and he was given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit. This doesn't mean hell's in the middle of the earth. This is something supernatural, this, this imagery, the shaft and the smoke coming from it. And, and this, word, this phrase, bottomless pit, I'm sorry, but whenever, whenever I hear the term bottomless pit, I always think of my son's stomachs. <laughs> Our grocery bill continues to climb as they continue to rise, Right. But this isn't what it's talking about. It's a bottomless pit. It's, it's, literally the word is abyss. This word is used seven times. The abyss in scripture is not the final hell. It's a place where the demonic are imprisoned and awaiting to be released upon the earth. Here's what's telling about this abyss. In Luke chapter eight, there's a man who's possessed with demons and Jesus confronts him and the demons share with Jesus that their name is Legion. So as Jesus goes to cast them out, these demons beg Beg not to be cast out into the abyss. So Jesus, even with mercy on demons, cast them instead into pigs, which shocked me because if demons don't want, if, if demons would prefer to be in pigs than in the abyss, how bad is the abyss? And how much worse is hell? Verse 3. Then from the smoke came locusts on the earth, and they were given power like the power of scorpions of the earth. They were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any green plant or any tree, but only those people who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. Don't think bugs. These are demonic beings. Again, this is John reaching with human language to define something infinite because you don't tell locusts what to do. They're bugs. But he's speaking about these demonic beings creatures who are released on the earth to bring its force upon humanity. And there's something excruciating that, that's about to unfold. And only those sealed with the, with the seal of God on their foreheads are not harmed. And again, last week, remember, we interpret scripture with scripture. And the seal on the forehead is not a cross or something literally on your forehead. The seal means that it's a private mark that is stamped in your soul, the Holy Spirit. The scripture says when you place your faith in Christ and you are born again, you are sealed with the Holy Spirit within you. And it's those who will not be touched. Then it goes on to say in verse 5, these locusts were allowed to torment the earth 
for five months, but not to kill them, the people. And their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it stings someone. So let's talk about that for a minute. I went down another rabbit trail this week on scorpions. And I noted that in many cases, people can be stung by a scorpion and experience a breathlessness. You can't catch your breath. Muscle thrashing and convulsions, vomiting, and also kind of a manic a manic thing where you can't rest, you can't sleep, and this would go on for five months. It's this excruciating kind of pain. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever been in excruciating pain of anything. I'll tell you one of my tops, a kidney stone. Anybody ever had a kidney stone? Yo, that is no joke, y'all. When I was in seminary, I had one, and I was in my room, and I felt a little something coming on. And next thing I know, I sat on the floor and I was like, what is happening to me right now? Next thing, I'm curled up in the fetal position on the floor of my room. My friend walks by, I'm curled up and like shaking. My whole body is shaking. And he said, hey man, let's go, don't die on me. And we jumped in the, his truck and off we go. I got to the emergency room and they always want your information as you're dying in the moment at the emergency room. <laughs> So I'm like shaking in pain, and she said, what do you think's happening? I said, I think it's a kidney stone. And she goes, ha, ha, ha. Well, you know, this is like a man's equivalent to a woman giving birth. <laughs> and I'm like, yo, how about that epidural going right up in there somewhere? <laughs> Get me out of this. Yeah, it was awful, y'all, awful. All right, I got over it. But here's the thing. That lasted about five hours. I can't even fathom five months. Now, now, notice what it goes on to say in verse 6. And in those days, people will seek death and will not find it. They will long to die, but death will flee from them. Now, this is a verse I wish I could skip over. This is a hard, this is what hell is. People in this moment have reached their limit emotionally, physically, spiritually so much that they're trying to commit suicide and can't. They maim themselves, they injure themselves, they incapacitate themselves, but they can't take their own lives. That's how Satan will treat people in hell. Where there is weeping, gnashing of teeth, this is Jesus' words, weeping, gnashing of teeth where the worm never dies. Also with that comes this excruciating kind of psychological terror. I don't have time. I'm trying to make up for some time here. Verses 7 through 12 talks about these locusts. They come like horses with chariots. So can you imagine hearing that? And then it says they have, some have lion's teeth and face like a man. And if you've been with us for this whole series, we learn in heaven there are these four living creatures who worship. One has the face of a man. One has the face of the lion. We talked about all of that. Notice how Satan is always trying to imitate God, but how grotesque it is, lion's teeth and locust imagery. <sighs> Y'all with me? I don't like preaching this part. Sixth trumpet, verse 13. Then the sixth angel blew his trumpet, released the four angels who were bound at the great river Euphrates. So the four angels who had been prepared for the hour, the day, the month, the year, were released to kill a third of mankind. So notice how meticulous God is in his sovereignty here. It's as if God knew that humanity in that day, or even those who come to Christ during this awful time, would think God has lost control. God is not in control. And John is writing down the words, no, God has the hour, the day, the month, the year in the palm of his hand. Your life and mine, and even in this day here. He's talking about fallen angels here. At this river Euphrates, here's the river Euphrates right there on the screen. Look at the countries it runs through. It runs through countries that want to wipe Israel off the map. And if you can squint your eyes real tight, you can see Israel in that little brown box there. And yet God has preserved that little nation all these centuries. Yeah. So Israel, Israel, all eyes on Israel, as we say. But yet at the same time, you know, you think about the great river Euphrates and just me just trying to put in my mind at that river right now, supernaturally, we cannot see them. But there are four angels standing around that river somewhere waiting on God's go 
to bring judgment upon the earth. Sobering, sobering. So now if you add it all together, four billion people, half the earth, eight billion typically, four billion people have died and gone to hell. But the mercy of God here is that he's not wiped out the other four. There's still time here to reach out for God. Now, knowing that there's time still for those, if I happened to be there, say I was and wasn't a believer, I would think by now, I would be trusting in Christ. Let me read verse 20. The rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands, nor give up worshiping demons and idols of gold and silver and bronze and stone and wood, which cannot see or hear or walk, nor did they repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immorality or their thefts. So for anyone to think, you know, if I start seeing water turn to blood and the sun and the moon and the stars darken and people trying to take their lives but can't, I'm thinking that's going to be my moment, I believe. Nope your heart will be even harder against God. How could God do that? And why would God? I don't believe God would. All that's going to make the heart, heart harder. Notice what these people love, what they were, were not willing to give up of the earth to have Christ. Well, they wouldn't give up worshiping demons. If you go to the New Old Testament, you see the chief worshiping of demons was often, or idols, was often Moloch, when people would take little babies and put them in the stomach of Moloch, the, the idol, and set it on fire to abort the baby in the Old Testament. That is called out by God specifically as, as evil in the eyes of God. Also, silver, bronze, stone, wood, those who love their money, those who love their stuff, those who love their desires, their pleasures. Also, it talks about they did not repent of their murders. They did not repent of their violence or their hatred or their unforgiveness. Also, their sorceries. That's, they love their horoscopes and astrology and crystals and wicker boards or uh, uh, tarot cards and palm readers and white magic and witchcraft. Where I live right now, they've already launched a second witch store. So that's really a big thing right now. White magic is what it's called. It's an abomination before God. There's sexual immorality. Sexual immorality, that word porneia that we've talked about for years here, that word porneia houses all the sexual sin, adultery, homosexuality, poly, polyamory, I think is how you say it, probably butchered that, promiscuity, uh, pedophilia, all that's implied here for those who did not repent of it. Mm. That's why if you find yourself anywhere in that list, repent and believe the Lord. Now there's an interlude. There's, there's sixth and seventh trumpet. There's like this parentheses. And this question that's been asked for ages, that how could God allow sin, injustice, and evil in the world and not do something about it? That question is now answered. Verse one. Then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven, wrapped in a cloud with a rainbow over his head, and his face was like the sun, and his legs like pillars of fire. So this is a reflection of who God was to God's people in Exodus again. When God delivered his people through the judgments on Egypt, he delivered them as a pillar of cloud, and then at night he was a pillar of fire to bring an Exodus to the promised land. So here's a reflection of this angel representing God like a cloud and like a pillar of fire bringing his people to the ultimate exodus, to the ultimate promised land, which is the new heaven and the new earth. Then in Revelation chapter 10, verse 5, it talks about a mighty scroll in this angel's hand, mighty angel with a scroll in his hand and a, and a roar and seven thunders. And he tells John not to write it down. So we don't know what that was, but God deemed us not to know it, which reminds us that the secret things belong to the Lord. There's some things that God will not share with us. And oh, by the way, in case I need to repeat it, as I've repeated it every week, God is under no obligation to explain himself to you. Verse 5. And the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever. Now, I just want you to pause and think of that image right there. This mighty angel, he has a foot on the sea, not in the sea on the sea, and he has one on land. So I don't know what kind of angel we're talking about, y'all. 
I, I don't know if this is some giant massive angel or something supernatural that we'll sense, but notice there's on the land, on the sea, and in one hand to heaven. What an image. And his hand is up, almost like in a courtroom, swearing that what's about to happen will happen. It says this, that the, him who created heaven and what is in it, the earth and what is in it, the sea and what is in it. Listen, the scriptures make a big deal and revelation makes a big deal that God exists and that God created. Psalm 14, one says, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. And that creation just kind of happened. No, God created it and he's to be worshiped for it. So this, there will be no more delay, but in the days of the trumpet call to be sounded by the seventh angel, the seventh trumpet, the mystery of God would be fulfilled just as he announced to his servants, the prophets. So what is the mystery now to be fulfilled? It's basically this. It will bring God's fulfillment of wrath upon human evil, human sin, human immorality, and human injustice. It will have ultimate defeat by the judgment of God. That's the answer to that big question. Verse nine. So I went to the angel and told him to give me the little scroll. And he said to me, take it and eat it. It will make your stomach bitter, but in your mouth it will be sweet as honey. And I was told you must again prophesy about many peoples and nations and languages and kings. So literally he's handing him the word of God. And he's to eat it. He's going to need some Pepto-Bismol, but he's going to need to eat it. Nobody gets that. Does anybody understand the Pepto-Bismol? Never mind. Okay. (laughs) He's going to have indigestion from eating it, all right? Because he's going to eat it. It's going to be bitter. And and so it's really telling about what God's truth can be to you and me. So today, what I'm preaching, I feel is very bitter. It's hard for me to preach it. I don't want to preach it. So I can't imagine what you're hearing right now and how bitter it is to hear it. Listen, I get it, but it's truth. Truth can be sweet and truth can be bitter, but it doesn't change the fact it's truth. So God's word, he eats it. Now think about that metaphor right there. That's exactly what it looks like when you read the Bible. You read the Bible to eat it, meaning you take it in, you digest it, so it gets into your feelings and your desires and your blood and your bone marrow. As you get into God's word, you get God's word into you. It's like food. You know, in scripture, the Bible's called this meat, milk, bread, honey. So that's, that's the understanding to be brought in, to chew it, to savor it, to digest it so that it becomes a part of you. And then comes this question. Will you only obey God's word when it's sweet Or will you also obey God's word when it's bitter, especially to your desires or your feelings? The truth always trumps it. Here we go. As we look at this, we've moved to chapter 11 now, and John is there, and for the sake of time, I'm just going to mention this. He's measuring this temple, and then he's measuring these people, and it has to do with the, 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 temp, the prophecy of the third temple to come and, 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 and all of that. Uh, it's, it's that God's going to hold a remnant of his people despite all this tribulation and great tribulation for those who have placed their faith in Christ through all this awfulness. He's going to preserve them like a remnant through it all. And then as we get into this seven years, so the tribulation, I forgot to mention, is seven years. Right here, you see a difference. We've been in the tribulation, which is the first three and a half years. Now we move into the great tribulation. Believe me, it, it, I mean, it gets worse to the second three and a half years. And here is where we meet who's called the two witnesses. And there's huge debate over these, but we'll land what we think these are and how it applies. It says in verse three, God will grant authority to my two witnesses for they will prophesy for three and a half years clothed in sackcloth. Now, who are these two witnesses? Verse four, these are two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. So this is Old Testament imagery. The two lampstands had to do with the olive oil in which there was worship to God. And uh, uh, I'm sorry, the two olive trees had to do with the oil, the olive oil worship to God. And then also the two lampstands that had to do with the, the light of God. This is very Jewish. It has to do with the temple. So people say, well, these two witnesses, they're, they're really representing the church of that day. God's people will still be there, and he's going to use the church to do miracles and preach the truth, and there's warrant for that. 
However, what we hold as a church and what I see here is that these are literally two people, two men, two. Because it's specific, two olive trees, two lampstands. And then the olive trees have to do with, the, with being filled with the, the oil of the Holy Spirit. Not just being sealed, which you are sealed, but an anointing in which to preach. And also the lampstand has to do with light and truth. So these are two witnesses who are sealed with the Holy Spirit filled with the Holy Spirit, and anointed to preach this truth to a very dark, dark, depraved world that is still living at that time. So what happens with these two? Verse 5, if anyone would harm these two witnesses, fire pours from their mouth and consumes their foes. If anyone would harm them, this is how he is doomed to be killed. Now listen, these guys aren't dragons, all right? They're not going to be breathing out fire. This has to do with the heat of the truth they're preaching against an immoral, evil world that has rebelled against God. It could also mean, as we'll see, that God has granted them miraculous powers and that fire from heaven literally can come down as it happened in the Old Testament. Either way, during this season, whoever tries to kill these two witnesses will die a violent death. Verse 6, they have the power to shut the sky and that no rain may fall during the days of their prophesying. And they have power over the waters to turn them into blood and strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they desire. So now we have an idea maybe who these two witnesses are. We know their names. One could be Elijah. Because if you go to the Old Testament, in a time of confrontation with these false prophets of a false god called Baal, Elijah prayed and fire from heaven came down and took out all those false prophets. Elijah also prayed and there was a drought on the land. So this looks like an Elijah. It also looks like the other witness could be Moses. Because Moses called down the plagues where you had the, the, the blood and the waters and also every other kind of plague. So it looks like Elijah and Moses in that day. Now, is it literally the Elijah and the Moses? I don't know. It could be two Jewish men who are filled with the anointing of the Holy Spirit in the spirit of Elijah and Moses. Either way, those are two bad dudes, bro. You don't want to mess with them <laughs> until God removes his hand on them. In verse 7, and when they have finished their preaching, their testimony, the beast that rises from the bottomless pit, this Antichrist will make war on them, conquer them, and kill them. Only the Antichrist could do it. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, that's Jerusalem, that symbolically then is called Sodom for its sexual morality, and Egypt for the worshiping of creation and idols, where Jesus, their Lord, was crucified. So let's just take this in for a minute. They are murdered and they lie on the street. Revelation 11:9 9 says, for three and a half days, the whole world will stare at their corpses. And we know that can happen today. You carry the phone in your pocket. And then from there, it says in verse 10 that the world watching this on their phones are so thrilled that these preachers and they're preaching against their desires and immorality that they love, finally they are dead and rotting corpses on the ground. And it says in that passage that they celebrate, they party, and even exchange presents with each other. I don't know how it gets more depraved than that. But then, verse 12 happens, and God breathes on them, and they stand up, y'all. And as they stand up, the world begins to tremble with great fear, and there's a voice that says, come up here, and they are taken up to be with God. And then verse 13, and at that hour, there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake, and the rest were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. Now listen, it says they gave glory to the God of heaven. It does not say that they repented. All kinds of people can give glory to the God of heaven when you go through loss, when you go through suffering, when you go through great fear. Oh, there's many that give glory to God then and how much you need him. But what happens two weeks later, two years later? Now what? Never true repentance. So watch your heart there. And then finally, we'll land it here, the seventh trumpet. Whew. If y'all had enough, <laughs> seventh trumpet. 
Then the seventh angel blew the trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who sit on their thrones before God fell on their faces, and they worshiped God, saying, We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, who is and who was, literally who's now come, for you have taken your great power and begun to reign. Here's my call for you today. Are you an unbeliever? Repent and believe the gospel. God's mercy's on you right now. You've just heard revelation from scripture. You may not get this again. Repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Secondly, for all of us who are Christians, will you obey God only when his word is sweet or will you obey God especially when his word tastes bitter? And then thirdly, Worship him. Worship him with your eyes this week. Worship him with your lips this week. Worship him with what you don't put in your ears this week, with how you do marriage this week, with how you do your job this week, with friends and relationships and purity and holiness. Worship him this week with your life. And then worship him in our final moments together with your lips and your heart. Worthy is the lamb who was slain. Holy, holy, holy is he that deserves our all. Amen and amen. Let's pray. So, Lord, there it is. That's bitter, but good. So we praise you for your truth. We praise you for your pursuit of us, even in this moment. And I pray there is a wave of repentance and those being born again under the sound of my voice. And the Lord, find us as your people repentant with our own sin. Find us worshipful in our lives and find us worshipful in these rooms to worship you. Oh, worthy the one who was slain and holy, holy, holy God to you. We praise you. In Jesus' name I pray. We all said amen. Amen.